Hi, hello student. Good evening to all of you. I hope I am audible and visible to you. Just uh, give me an information. Good evening, audible, visible, everything clear. Okay, first give me a nod. Whether I am audible. Okay, perfect. So good evening to all of you. Uh, right, many of you are joining. So, as you know, that this session is essential one-liners for INA set examination. So, very good. Thank you so much for the confirmation that I am audible and visible to you. So, what we are going to do today, as you know, we are going to discuss uh, the single line, most important single line for the upcoming INA set examination, right? So, what I have done, right? previous session where will you get okay so previous session i have uh, the link in my youtube channel also as well as in pre bladder youtube channel also or you can contact me anywhere i will give you uh, the link of the session if you want to listen because uh, it's a very important thing that previously i have taken one image based question uh, for ini set and one uh, neat pg marathon in both the cases i have discussed few images important images which are very very important for both INI set as well as neat pg so if you are thinking for INI set and i uh, know that uh, many of you have not got yet time i mean enough time for preparing physiology right because you are busy with other 19 subject and uh, there are big subject there are uh, important subject so most of the cases what you do student uh, you ignore physiology and uh, last minute some material collection uh, is the tendency of many students i know so um, this session where i am taking the single one liner for ina set as well as another session that i have taken previously in prebletter youtube channel only that is the image based question for ini set these two sessions are one of the most important uh, if you want to give a quick revision of physiology right uh, there is no guarantee that obviously the questions will come from here but you will get a confidence that i know many of the previous year questions answer and i know many important uh, concept of physiology so that way uh, this session as well as one image based question for ini set are very very important obviously it will be useful for the fmg examination also because you know nowadays there is very little difference between neat pg questions and fmg questions very little difference between ini set questions as well as your uh, fmg questions so this is also beneficial for other students also so now let's start the session i hope by the time all of you know that i am dr shoman manna your physiology teacher right so without much time we are going to discuss one liner and what i will do here we are not going to discuss the uh, detailed explanation of the one liner because you know the ini set is just knocking at your door there is very less time so at that point of time i know you don't want to waste your valuable time so what we will do we will just discuss the answer of the one liner and a little bit related explanation if it is needed at all right okay so what you have to do you have to just mock up at least this information because this is not the point where you will develop your concept right because time is very less before exam okay and second thing is that please uh, revise this one liner okay before your exam day and also if you get time look at the image based session at least the important images okay right so now let's start so first one liner that we are discussing here is related to the cardiovascular physiology so look at the first line okay this is very very simple question but it has been asked in uh, your gymmar mcq so it may be asked in future also so when the heart rate is 70 beat per minute cardiac cycle duration so all of you know that the cardiac cycle duration will be one uh, minute that is the 60 second upon your heart rate that is 70 so 60 upon 70 it will be around 0.8 57 0.857 seconds right so this is the answer of the question now look at the second one liner okay very good all of you have done well so 850 millisecond approximate is the cardiac cycle duration here now look at the second resting membrane potential of cardiac muscle 
it should be on your fingertips right so whenever i'll ask this kind of question resting membrane potential of cardiac muscle this is 90 minus 90 millivolt and this same minus 90 millivolt is also the resting membrane potential of skeletal muscles also so the skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle both of them has a resting membrane potential of minus 90 millivolt so what about smooth muscle so you remember this extra that smooth muscle has a resting membrane potential of minus 60 to minus 50 millivolt the different range has given in different books but for minus 60 to minus 50 millivolt and we all know that the neuron has an rmp of minus 70 millivolt okay so you are answering the next one liner the normal av nodal delay right so normal av nodal delay all of you know that this is in and around 100 millisecond very good 100 millisecond right so the range here is 60 to 125 millisecond remember this range also so normal av nodal delay is 100 millisecond sometimes question can also be asked that what is the his bundle delay okay his bundle delay tell me the answer of this what is the normal his bundle delay okay av nodal delay is 100 millisecond very good dr arun you are going ahead but tell me the answer of this related question so av nodal delay is 100 millisecond this is a previous year question in ini set and his bundle delay if this is the question then on an average this is 40 millisecond the range is 35 to 55 millisecond got it so 35 to 55 millisecond is the his bundle delay now this electromechanical systole it has been asked in aims entrance examination the electromechanical systole is known as the qs2 duration so remember this qs2 so what is qs2 q is the onset of the q wave in the ecg and s2 is the second heart sound so the duration of the qs2 starting from the q wave okay up to up to the generation of the second heart sound s2 this duration is known as the electromechanical systole duration here you know that this kind of diagram you must have seen in a book we are not going to discuss the detail of the diagram but as you can see here the multiple phases of the uh, cardiac cycle has been depicted here and as you can find out here the heart sound has been recorded here this is the s4 this is s1 this is s2 this is s3 and this is s4 so heart sound is recorded with the help of phonocardiogram phonocardiogram right and this ecg is also recorded so if you measure the duration starting from the beginning of the q wave up to the this second heart sound then this duration is known as the electro mechanical systole duration so it is a systole but electrical systole that is the beginning of the q wave and ending of the mechanical systole is the s2 so q s2 is electromechanical systole and this kind of diagram is known as the uyghur diagram right okay so moving on to next so here it is written which scientific method is the basis of thermodilution method used for measuring cardiac output tell me the answer of this this has been asked in aims entrance examination so what is the answer of this question thermodilution method okay so the principle by which the no thermodilution method is used the principle is known as the stewart hamilton right stewart hamilton method or stewart hamilton principle okay don't forget just mock it up so stewart hamilton principle you don't have to remember what is the principle actually but if the question is what is the basis of thermodilution method or what is the basis of di dilution method you must have heard that indicator dilution method or di dilution method okay okay so what is sorry okay so di dilution method or thermodilution method if the question is asked what is the principle behind this your answer will be stewart hamilton method or stewart hamilton principle it has been asked in previous year mcq so please please remember and this thermodilution method thermodilution method this is known as the gold standard method for 
cardiac output measurement. This is known as the gold standard method for cardiac output measurement. So, this can also be asked in future MCQ. Right, okay. So, this is done. Now, we are coming to the next second line. Main site of peripheral vascular resistance is very, very important and very, very easy also. So, all of you know that arterioles, arterioles are the site of total peripheral resistance. So, remember here. So, whenever we are saying peripheral vascular resistance, peripheral vascular resistance or systemic vascular resistance, this is same, right. Peripheral vascular resistance or systemic vascular resistance, if the question is like this, then the maximum resistance is at the level of arterioles. Please note down, okay. Now, also remember another example that uh, another important information that is the total pulmonary vascular resistance sometimes question has been asked pulmonary vascular resistance is more than systemic vascular resistance or less than systemic vascular resistance this concept is also required so remember pulmonary vascular resistance resistance of the pulmonary vessels is only one tenth of the systemic vascular resistance okay so total systemic vascular resistance and total pulmonary vascular resistance pulmonary vascular resistance is only one tenth of the systemic vascular resistance this is also important now Third is carotid body baroreceptor is most sensitive to. Okay. So, here the question is baroreceptor. What is the answer? Tell me. This has been asked in twice in INI set and AIMS entrance examination. What will be the answer? Carotid body baroreceptor is most sensitive to which blood pressure they are asking? Obviously, pressure. Obviously. Okay. Because it is not chemoreceptor. Chemoreceptor, they are most sensitive to carbon dioxide. I know. But here it is baroreceptor stretch but stretch will be done by blood pressure so which blood pressure they are asking that baroreceptor is most sensitive to which blood pressure right diastolic blood pressure systolic blood pressure mean arterial pressure i got many answer but the answer is pulse pressure right please please remember this is the pulse pressure okay so if the question is baroreceptor is most sensitive to your answer is pulse pressure get up than mean arterial pressure even if it is both the options are given pulse pressure mean arterial pressure systolic pressure diastolic pressure your answer will be pulse pressure look at this is the cutout taken from genong right so here you can find out that genong is writing that carotid sinus and aortic arch these are the two location where the baroreceptor are located these two baroreceptor are supplied by this 9 10 10 cranial nerve we all know and these baroreceptor are most sensitive to change in pulse pressure so this is the direct line taken from genong 25th edition page number 598 because this is in controversial little bit controversial so that's uh, that's why i have kept this information here so please 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 remember that the baroreceptor they are the stretch receptor they are the stretch receptor if the stretch receptor is not present in the option then you can choose this that baroreceptor are the mechanoreceptor so whenever there is mechanical deformation of this receptor the receptor get activated right and what is the stimulus for baroreceptor increase in blood pressure now the question is among different blood pressure baroreceptor is most sensitive to which blood pressure your answer is pulse pressure get up then mean arterial pressure okay so baroreceptor can be stimulated by increase in any of the blood pressure pulse pressure mean pressure systolic pressure diastolic pressure but it is most sensitive to pulse pressure never forget this information this is very very important for any kind of examination okay now next so again three line highest total cross-sectional area in the vascular system i hope all of you know the correct answer so tell me what is the answer highest total cross-sectional area in the vascular system why this cross-sectional area is important because you know that velocity of blood flow velocity of exactly velocity of blood flow is inversely proportionate to the total cross-sectional area so cross-sectional area is highest mean velocity of the blood flow at that location will be the lowest and we all know that the maximum okay total cross-sectional area is highest at the level of capillaries okay okay so whenever we are seeking uh, taking uh, whenever we are discussing that highest total cross-sectional area the word here is used total so although if you take the cross-section of a single capillary the cross-sectional area is very very less less least 
but here we are talking about the total cross sectional area of all the capillaries which are present in our body so obviously it is highest among all the blood vessels right and that's why we know that the velocity of the blood flow becomes slowest at the level of capillary and that is helpful for the exchange of gases at the level of tissues okay now coming to the second line so what is the answer of this reflex responsible for tachycardia during right atrial distension please tell me the answer very very important very very important it has been asked in previous year question only so all this line that we are discussing here now these are the previous year question only very good so whenever we are talking about tachycardia and this is right atrial distension right so your answer is bane bridge reflex bane bridge reflexes right so bane bridge reflex absolutely absolutely okay so please remember one extra information due to any condition if there is increase in venous return to the right atrium venous return to the right atrium right so there will be distension of the right atrium whenever there is distension of the right atrium what will happen there will be increased secretion of atrial natriuretic peptide there will be decrease production of adh hormone because this right atrium is connected with the hypothalamic nucleus which secrete this adh right synthesize this adh so there will be increased secretion of atrial natriuretic peptide from right atrial muscle there will be decrease synthesis of adh hormone and there will be activation of the bane bridge reflexes and due to the activation of this bane bridge reflexes what happen the heart rate increases so please remember bane bridge reflex is a very selective reflex why i'm saying selective because it will only increases the heart rate if i ask you can bane bridge reflex increases the contractility and other parameter answer is no it will only change the heart rate now if there is increase in heart rate there will be change in other parameter like cardiac output may increase if your stroke volume is constant that is secondary but the only thing that is related to direct action of bane bridge reflex is the heart rate so bane bridge reflex has selective action on heart that is to increase the heart rate by inhibiting the parasympathetic system and stimulating the sympathetic system that is your bane bridge reflex right please remember okay now second third line all of you have answered that the bejol jerry's reflex is due to which chemical okay so here i got certain answer very good very good dr arun okay so you are preparing and my best wishes for all of you so the question that has been asked in previous year ems that is serotonin so the option which were given in the question that was serotonin so the bejol jerry's reflex we know that this is a uh, coronary chemoreceptor reflexes coronary chemoreceptor reflexes so the receptor for this bejol jerry's reflex where they are located we all know that the receptor for this reflex is located on the left ventricular muscle left ventricular valve receptor hota hai and this receptor are sensitive to chemical signals the most important chemicals we have to remember serotonin apart from serotonin there are capsaicin there are vera tri din and phenyl phenyl by guanide okay so all of you know that phenyl by guanide is the agonist of 5 ht3 receptor so please remember all these four names because you don't know what options will be given in the questions so bejol jerry's reflex is a coronary chemoreceptor reflex the receptor for this reflex is located on the left ventricular muscle wall how this receptor will be activated due to presence of certain chemical in the coronary arteries particularly left coronary arteries what are those chemicals serotonin capsaicin veratrodin and phenylvigonide whenever this chemicals are present the reflexes will be activated and due to activation of the reflexes what is the response that is also important there will be severe hypotension there will be severe bradycardia there will be coronary vasodilatation coronary vasodilatation and also there will be apnea followed by hyperventilation so this is apnea followed by hyperventilation so apnea okay followed by hyperventilation so please please remember whenever the bejol jerry's reflex is activated there will be severe hypotension severe bradycardia coronary vasodilatation and apnea followed by hyperventilation 
got it so basal jerry's reflex will be activated due to presence of certain chemicals what are the chemicals that we have discussed clinically the basal jerry's reflex can be activated in which clinical condition remember after myocardial infractions whenever you give reperfusion therapy the dead muscle cells can releases this kind of chemical so i have to remember that this basal jerry's reflex although this is rare but sometimes it can be activated after myocardial infractions when reperfusion therapy is given number one second during coronary angiography so whenever the dye is injected that time suddenly this basal jerry's reflex can be activated and third you have to remember that during spinal anesthesia this reflex can also be activated in rare conditions but whenever this reflex is activated there will be severe hypotension severe bradycardia coronary vasodilatation apnea followed by hyper ventilations right so this is all about basal jerry's reflex that you have to remember fine okay so this is one of the important slide okay where these are the all previous year questions but the related things that you also have to remember okay now we are moving to the next slide so here the ANREF effect is described by so what is ANREF effect that you have to choose from multiple options that was the actual question in the AIMS MCQ so ANREF effect could you recall so whenever there is increase in after load whenever there is increase in after load it increases the contractility of the heart it increases the contracti contractility of the heart this is known as the andre effect increase after load increases the contractility of the heart right so what is this this is nothing but andre effect so please please remember this sentence you have to remember that increase in after load increases the contractility now you also know that if there is increase in preload 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 is a industrial volume it can also increases the contractility of the heart so increase in preload can also increases the contractility of the heart this is known as the frank sterling law frank sterling law all of you know right okay and this bowditch effect of the heart is best described by so bowditch effect is saying increase in heart rate increases the contractility of the heart contractility of the heart right so increase in preload increase in the contractility that is a frank sterling law increase in after load increasing the contractility that is the andrep effect and increase in heart rate can also increases the contractility this is nothing but our bowditch effect or force frequency relationship of the heart right so these are the thing that you have to remember so three things one is andrep one is bowditch and one is frank sterling okay frank sterling all of you know i am 100 percent sure but bowditch and this andrep is important for future mcq okay now functions of hcn channel now tell me this hcn channel is nowadays a very very popular and already multiple mcqs have been asked so all of you know that this hcn channel is uh, particularly present in the nodal tissue but if you look at the current literature yes this is a channel for funny current right we know that this is a channel which is known as a funny current exactly evabradin is the drug which block this channel right to decrease the heart rate so this is specially present in the nodal tissue si node av node but it is also present in the central nervous system particularly at the level of synapse dendrites of hippocampus and basal ganglia at least you remember these two names so apart from nodal tissue yes it is also there in the retina it is also there at the surface of the tongue but you have to remember that it is also present at the level of synapse at the level of dendrites of hippocampus as well as basal ganglia why i'm saying these two are important because nowadays some scientist has got some relationship that this channel is altered in case of parkinsonism disease so you never know in future the question will be asked okay so the functions of hcn channel in nodal tissue what is the role of nodal tissue hcn channel this is the channel which is responsible for pacemaking activity of the nodal tissue means sinus rhythm maintenance so this is the functions 
maintaining maintaining sinus rhythm sinus rhythm of nodal tissue okay so sinus rhythm is maintained by this hcn channel now tell me hcn channel is permeable for which ion which ion enter through this channel this is also been asked in previous year mcq so the channel is permeable for sodium as well as potassium channel so it is a sodium potassium channel it's a cationic channel but which cation specially have to remember sodium as well as potassium it has been asked previously both it is permeable for sodium as well as potassium now this is a voltage gated channel ligand gated channel so the channel is known as hcn channel h stands for hyperpolarization hyperpolarization induced channel means the channel is opening in negative voltage condition which is very very peculiar and that's why the funny name is given to this channel funny because most of the channel in our body they opens in depolarization state of the membrane but here it is opening in hyperpolarizing condition that's why it's a funny second thing is that c this c stands for c a m p gated channel means c a m p cyclic adenosine monophosphate is a stimulus stimulator for this channel so the channel is a voltage gated also as well as ligand gated also so please please remember this has been asked already in one of the ini site examination that the channel is only voltage gated no it is not only voltage gated obviously the voltage hyperpolarization is a stimulus for opening of this channel but ligand like camp is also a stimulator for this channel so voltage gated as well as ligand gated although it is not a typical voltage gated because negative voltage is a opener for this channel okay now one extra thing that you have to remember that previously you used to read about the hcn channel nowadays they are saying that hcn channel has four different sub variety what are they hcn1 hcn2 hcn3 hcn4 so the total different sub variety okay has been discovered regarding this hcn channel and they may ask you that the nodal tissue contain which sub variety of hcn channel tell me okay suppose you don't know the answer of this question so what is the common thinking okay in exam most of you will mark that it is hcn1 but that is not the answer the nodal tissue or the sa node contain hcn subtype 4 that is the main hcn channel which is present in the nodal tissue although sub variety 1 and sub variety 2 is also present but the main hcn channel which is present in the nodal tissue of the heart is hcn sub variety 4 that's why you should remember this little extra rather other sub variety of the hcn channel they are present in the central nervous system mainly but for the heart it is hcn channel 4 right that is most important get it now coming to the next slide of the cardiovascular system best index of after load okay just hold on don't answer best index of after load is the mean arterial pressure which depends on which depends on total peripheral resistance so please listen my word if the question is after load what do you mean by after load after load means it is the load okay it is the load applied on the ventricular muscle after the onset of contraction so in the ventricle has started contraction what is the load applicable on the ventricular muscle how much load the muscle is getting during the contraction during the systole that's why whenever we are saying after load it is the load during systole during systole or the systolic load on ventricular muscles so you know that when the left ventricle is pumping blood to the arch of aorta the ventricle has to overcome which pressure the ventricle has to overcome the aortic pressure more the aortic pressure the ventricle has to pump more forcefully that's why whenever the question is best index of after load your answer is aortic pressure which aortic pressure mean arterial pressure but all of you know the formula of mean aortic pressure map is equal to cardiac output multiplied by total peripheral resistance so one of the most important determinant of the mean arterial pressure is total peripheral resistance that's why in some of the books they are writing that the best index of after load is tpr but it is not tpr tpr is the best determinant of after load but best index of after load is mean 
arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure depends on total peripheral resistance. So, if the question is after load based determinant, TPR is the answer. After load based index, your answer is mean arterial pressure. Similarly, whenever the question is about preload, okay, all of you know that the best index of preload is the end diastolic volume, okay, end diastolic volume, right? And what is the determinant? of end diastolic volume. So, you all know that end diastolic volume depends on how much venous return is coming to the right atrium. So, the venous return is the best determinant of the preload and end diastolic volume is the best index of preload, right. So, these two important thing that you have to remember as a important line, right. Now, next second line nitric oxide, okay. Exert is vasodilatation through generation of which second messenger? We all know that is a CGMP, cyclic guanosine monophosphate. Second messenger is asking question, so CGMP is the answer, right? Great. Now, next, deficiency of which clotting factor will not affect the clotting in vivo? So, you know that there is a um, intrinsic pathway and there is an extrinsic pathway. You know that there is, if there is deficiency of clotting factor, there will be bleeding disorder. But two factors are there where uh, these two factors are very, very less important in intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. That is the factor number 12 and factor number 11. Great. Great. Okay. So, the question that has been asked previous, previously in Ames question, their option was the 12. But even if 12 is not there, 11 can also be answered. So, 11 and 12, if there is deficiency, the clinical bleeding is very, very less because the importance of these two factor in vivo clotting is less, right? Okay. So, next is one simple calculation. You know, sometimes in AIMS um, uh, examination, particularly the INI set uh, examination, they give you some problem based question like here. This question has already been given. What is the blood volume of a subject? with body weight of 60 kg and hematocrit is 45 percentage. So, generally uh, I do not prefer Hindi language mix up because there are multiple problem in that. Okay. Mm, so, I try to speak is very simple English because my English is also not that great. So, I hope there is no problem in understanding the simple English. Okay. Uh, so, try to understand doctor. Right. Okay. So, yes, yes. So, see, whenever the question is a blood volume, remember the blood volume is equal to 8 percentage of total body weight of the person. This is a rough estimation. So, if your body weight is 70 kg, 8 percentage of the 70 kg. Okay. 8, 8 percentage of the 70 kg. Okay. That is 5.6 liter is the total blood volume. So, here is the 60 kg. So, 8 percentage of 60 kg. Okay. That is 4.8 liter is the total blood volume. That is the rough calculation. But, you look at the question. If the question is giving you the hematocrit value also, then you have to use a different formula for the correction of this hematocrit. Because you know that uh, suppose the hematocrit of the person is very low, the person is suffering from severe anemia, then you cannot apply this formula that 8 percent of the total body weight is equal to blood volume. Okay. So, in this cases because the hematocrit is given, although this hematocrit value is normal, still we have to include this hematocrit into our formula. So, we all know that the formula for blood volume calculation that is the blood volume is equal to okay, your plasma volume upon your 1 minus hematocrit value HCT, right? So, in this cases, whenever the body weight is 60 kg, the plasma volume, okay, you know plasma volume is 5 percentage of the total body weight that is the 3 liter is the plasma, plasma volume of this person. So, whenever you got this plasma volume as 3 liter, so 3 upon 1 minus hematocrit, hematocrit is 45 percentage. So, 45 upon 100 that is 0 0.45. So, 1 minus 0 0.45, 3 upon this, if you do this, it will be 5.45 liter approximately. And this was the options given in the previous year question, right? So, please, please remember this simple formula of Hemat blood volume calculation from hematocrit. Okay, right. And the next problem: What is the cardiac output of a patient when a arterial oxygen is 20 ml per deciliter, venous oxygen is 16 ml per deciliter, and the whole body oxygen consumption is 300 ml per minute? 
so you know that here you have to apply one formula for calculation of the cardiac output and that is the fixed principles fixed principle of cardiac output measurement no 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 if there is ascites you cannot apply this obviously you cannot apply this because that is the extra volume uh, there will be extra vacation of fluid okay exactly exactly so this is a fixed principle right so the fixed principle is saying that the cardiac output is equal to oxygen consumption by the person oxygen consumption by the person minus okay upon your artery minus venous oxygen content this is the formula which is used for the fixed principle so here the oxygen consumption is given 300 ml and if you look at this oxygen and carbon dioxide so here oxygen in the arterial blood is given 20 ml per deciliter so per deciliter means you know deciliter is 100 ml so 20 ml per 100 ml of blood so if you express in per ml of blood so it will be 0 0.2 right minus 0 0.16 so this is the formula so obviously if you calculate this it will be 7500 ml so 7.5 liter is the cardiac output of this person 7.5 liter is the cardiac output of this person getting okay so this way some questions has been given previously so i hope all of you are understanding this please remember this simple simple formula it will give you answer in the examination okay now next so we have done almost all the important single liner from the cardiovascular system which has been asked previously now coming to the renal physiology very very important the first line glucose transporter present on the apical membrane of the proximal convoluted tubules tell me mm. so what is the catch you remember that proximal tubule has two part one is the proximal straight tubule and one is the proximal convoluted tubules okay so both of them are the part of the proximal tubule proximal tubule okay so first part is the proximal convoluted tubules and the second part is the proximal straight tubule so the proximal convoluted tubules it contain the sglt2 and this proximal straight table contain SGLT1. So we all know that kidney contain both the SGLT, SGLT2 also, SGLT1 also. But the major portion of the glucose, that is the 90% of the glucose is absorbed by SGLT2, that is the first portion. And the second portion, that is the 10% of glucose is absorbed by the PST or the proximal straight table. That's why the answer of the second option, second question, that is percentage of glucose absorption occurring in the late proximal tubules. It is only the 10 percentage and this is due to SGLT1, right? Now, one important another thing that you have to remember, here the question is asking about the apical membrane. Be careful in your examinations because if the question is apical membrane, then your answer is SGLT2 and SGLT1 in respective part but whenever the question is about the basolateral membrane remember if the question is basolateral membrane then so suppose this is the cell okay apical membrane contain sglt basal basolateral membrane will contain the glute glut remember what i am saying so if the question is apical membrane like here so apical membrane contain sglt if it is sglt2 then basolateral membrane will contain GLUT2. And if it is SGLT1 on the apical membrane, basolateral membrane will contain GLUT1. Very easy to remember. So, just remember a cell. Apical membrane is SGLT and basolateral membrane is GLUT. Both are the glucose transporter, but SGLT is the secondary active transporter and GLUT is the facilitated diffusion, right? Facilitated diffusion. So, if apical membrane contain SGLT2, basolateral membrane will contain GLUT2. If the apical membrane contain SGLT1, basolateral membrane will contain SGLT, I uh, sorry, GLUT1. That is the thing that you have to remember. Fine. Okay. I hope this is clear to all of you. Tell me whether you got it. Okay. Everybody, just give me thumbs up whether you get it. This is very, very important thing. Right. Right? All of you got it? Hmm. 
very good okay so now here so whenever the question is about the insulin dependent glute we all know that glute 4 obviously glute 4 is the answer but apart from that glute 12 is also a insulin dependent glute okay so we all know that glute 4 is located in which muscles it is the skeletal muscle cardiac muscle so it is present in the muscle skeletal and cardiac muscle as well as it is also present in the adipose tissue it is also present in the adipose tissue skeletal muscle cardiac muscle adipose tissue and glute 12 it is present in the prostate okay prostate and it is also present in the heart muscle so the muscles of the heart and the prostate these are two are the location of the glute 12 so please remember whenever we say uh, glucose uh, insulin dependent glute insulin dependent uh, okay here it is independent so insulin dependent glute okay insulin independent glucose uptake is seen in that is different question we are talking about the glucose dependent okay uh, sorry insulin dependent glute so insulin dependent glute is glute 4 and glute 12 right so actual question what was there in the examination that is insulin independent glucose uptake is seen in all of the following except so from there we have to choose this apart okay but whenever the question is insulin independent glute we all know there are multiple example so glute 1 talk about the rbc glute 3 okay about neuron okay even the glute 2 which is present in the pancreatic beta cell and all all of them are glucose independent insulin independent glute right but you have to remember this glucose uh, uh, i mean insulin dependent glute insulin dependent glute are which that is a glute 4 and glute 12 that is a insulin dependent glute baki so independent here okay and you have to remember at least one glute one and glute three where they are located that's all okay fine okay now next is that in the late pct of kidney luminal concentration increases for which ions okay this question has been asked in one of the recent ini site examination so what the question is question you know ki whenever there is filtration from the glomerulus there will be filtration of sodium there will be filtration of chloride there will be filtration of bicarbonate glucose amino acid everything okay many things will be filtered but from that filtered we know that sodium will be reabsorbed bicarbonate will be reabsorbed glucose will be reabsorbed amino acid will be reabsorbed but in the pro proximal part of pct chloride absorptions occur very less why because you know in the proximal part sodium reabsorption occurs along with bicarbonate mostly so we all know that whenever there is filtration there will be filtration of equal amount of sodium equal amount of chloride but in the proximal part of pct you are reabsorbing sodium along with the bicarbonate mainly sodium along with the glucose only sodium along with amino acid so who is not absorbed in the proximal part of proximal table that is a chloride so that's why if you look at the later half of the proximal table then the chloride concentration increases a little bit increases a little bit okay because sodium is selectively reabsorbed in the proximal part along with bicarbonate along with glucose along with amino acid and chloride is left behind that is the answer so chloride is the answer in this question then second line macula densa formed by which part of the nephron i know that there is a uh, old school of thought that the macula densa are the cells of dct although one question has been asked which is very old question but nowadays whenever the question is asking about the macula densa there must be an option of tal so please remember if you have to choose a single best answer that macula densa are the cells of which part of the nephron uppermost part of the thick ascending limb of loop of henle so it is the uppermost part of the thick ascending limb of loop of henle if this is not given in the choices then your second choice will be tal okay dct junction tal and dct junctions if that is also not given then and then only you will mark dct i am telling you please believe me it is clearly written in genong also it is clearly given in gaitan also and by the time you must have 
clear your concept that macula densa are not the cells of DCT. It is the uppermost part of the TAL because you know that this macula densa cell contain one channels at the apical membranes of the cells and this channel is nothing but NKCC. So, macula densa cells contain one channels on the apical membrane that is the NKCC. Now, if I ask you that NKCC channel is typical of which part of the nephron? This NKCC channel is blocked by a drug diuretics that is the furosemides. All of you know that furosemides. So, furosemide has its site of action on which part of the nephron? Your answer is TAL. So, please remember that this TAL are the cells of macula densa and which part of the TL? The part of the TL, the uppermost part of the TL where the DCT is starting. So, TL and DCT junction that is the actual answer. So, if I have to choose one between TAL and DCT, I will choose TL. Uppermost part of the TL is the macula densa. If that is not given TAL DCT junction. So, the recent MCQ that has been asked in INI set, this was given in the choices that macula densa are the cells of TAL DCT junction. Got it? Okay. Now, third line erythropoietin acts on. Erythropoietin is secreted from which cell of the kidney? First tell me the answer. Erythropoietin is secreted from which cell of the kidney? Okay. I know that it is secreted from kidney, but which cell of kidney? Okay. So, erythropoietin is secreted from. So, renin is secreted by, we all know that it is the J, G cell, juxtaglomerular cell. That is the renin. That is why I am writing here. Okay. Huh. And erythropoietin is secreted from, it is secreted from peritubular peritubular capillary cells. Please remember. So, erythropoietin is secreted by peritubular capillary cells of kidney and it is also secreted from liver, a very less amount, perisinusoidal hepatocyte. So, please remember two words, peritubular capillary cells of kidney, peritubular capillary cells of kidney and perisinusoidal hepatocyte, perisinusoidal hepatocyte. These two are the source of erythropoietin in our body and renin is secreted by JG cell. Both question has been asked. Sometimes we do silly mistake in examination. We mark JG cell, but JG cell is for the secretion of renin, right? And erythropoietin is secreted from peritubular capillary cells of kidney and perisinusoidal hepatocyte. Now, erythropoietin act on stem cell, but stem cell does not mean all the stem cells. So, here the whole erythropoietic series has been given here that is the hematopoietic stem cell, common myeloid progenitor cell, then granulocyte, manocyte uh, progenitor cell and megakaryocyte erythropoid pro erythroid progenitor cell and then we can find out here burst forming unit, colony forming unit, pro erythroblast, basophilic pro polytochromatophilic, orthochromatophilic, then reticulocyte and erythrocyte. So, if I have to choose that among all these series, erythropoietin act on which cell, your single best answer will be colony forming unit erythroblast. This is the main cell stage where erythropoietin act. But remember the extra information, erythropoietin can act on any cell starting from the burst forming unit, colony forming unit, it can also act on pro erythroblast, it can also act on basophilic erythroblast, it can also act on polychromatophilic erythroblast. But there is no action of erythropoietin on this orthochromatophilic reticulocyte or erythrocyte or earlier stage of stem cell like this. Okay? So, please, please remember erythropoietin can act on any of the cell series starting from burst forming unit up to this polychromatophilic erythroblast. But if the question is main action of erythropoietin, then your answer will be the cells which contain highest concentration of the erythropoietin receptor and which cell contain highest concentration of the erythropoietin receptor on its surface that is a colony forming unit erythroblast. So, please, please remember this is the answer that erythropoietin act mainly on CAPU erythroblast series of cell. Got it? Okay. Now, next. Okay. 
maximum air flow resistance is seen in which part of the respiratory system so you know that resistance of air flow or resistance of blood flow is maximum in the area where the uh, diameter or the radius is less but you know key in cardiovascular system maximum resistance is not at the level of capillary it is maximum at the level of arteriole and in respiratory system maximum resistance of air flow is not at the level of bronchioles that you have to remember because there is a concept yes that is on the parallel circuit and that i have explained in my lecture detail but for the timing you remember that maximum air flow resistance is at the level of bronchus okay medium size bronchus medium size bronchus okay or anatomically lower or segmental bronchus lower and segmental bronchus so please please remember that lower and segmental bronchus that is the area where the uh, resistance to air flow is maximum okay medium size bronchus is the actual answer so the question that has been asked previously in aims pg entrance examination that is the maximum air flow resistance options was bronchioles upper airways bronchus your answer will be bronchus which part of the bronchus medium size bronchus medium size bronchus means who are they they are the lower and segmental bronchus right but in physiology you know we follow a division divisional classification that is trachea is zero division then first major bronchus is division number one so this way if you go on dividing the respiratory system maximum resistance is at the level of division number division number four to five four to five so division number four to five is obviously bronchus they are the medium size bronchus so you remember all these three answer anything can be given in your choices so either your answer will be medium size bronchus medium size bronchus are nothing but the lower or segmental bronchus or they are the division number four to five division of respiratory system all this can be given in the choices okay yes okay so first line is done now the second line so if lung was allowed to recoil without chest wall so we all know that if this is the lung right it has an inherent tendency to recoil in the inward direction right and we also know that outside this there is presence of chest wall which has an inherent tendency to expand in the outward direction now please note down when this elastic recoiling of the lung okay so this inward directed elastic recoiling of the lung and outward directed recoiling of the chest wall they will balance out each other when the volume of the respiratory system is frc functional residual capacity so when the functional residual capacity is there this functional residual capacity is known as the resting lung volume or relaxation lung volume why because at frc the inward recoiling force of the lung is balancing the outward recoiling force of the chest wall now what is the question here the question here is saying that if you remove the chest wall if you remove the chest wall right so what will happen so this lung tissue is going to collapse the lung tissue is going to collapse there will be full collapse of lung but please remember even after full collapse of the lung the volume inside the lung is not zero okay because there will be closure of these bronchioles even before the closure of the full closure of the alveoli that's why alveoli will entrap a little amount of volume and this volume is not very less this is approximate 500 ml the name of this volume is known as the minimal volume minimal volume so that's why the answer of this question will be minimal minimal volume please please remember the answer of this question is minimal volume now if i ask you in the opposite direction that you <clears throat> remove lungs from this complete system so lung and chest wall both are forming a respiratory system if you remove the chest wall lung will collapse and the volume is minimal volume now i am doing the opposite i am removing the lung from the chest wall 
so what will happen the chest wall will try to expand in the outward direction so the chest wall will go on expanding like this expanding like this and then it will be stabilized at a particular volume what is that volume so how much the chest wall will expand what will be the volume of the chest wall after full expansion if you remove the lung your answer will be the volume will be 70 percent of the total lung capacity so please please remember if you remove the chest wall lung will collapse and the volume will be minimal volume 500 ml and if you remove the lung the chest wall will expand in the outward direction how much expansion is possible it will entrap a volume of 70 percent of the total lung capacity the detailed version discussion is not possible but for the timing you just remember this information okay that if you if this is the question that lung were allowed to recoil without the chest wall okay that is minimal volume and if the question is if the chest wall is allowed to expand if the chest wall is allowed to expand without lung then how much expansion will occur okay that is 70 percent of the tlc that is the neutral position of the chest wall okay please note down this important information now next now first line that is given here all of you will answer correctly ventilation perfusion ratio is maximum at so <clears throat> if the question is only ventilation then it is maximum at the level of base if it is only question of perfusion perfusion of the lung is maximum at which part again your answer is base but whenever the question is ventilation perfusion ratio then the ratio is maximum at the level of apex yes very good that is the 3.3 so that is the 3.3 and the minimum ratio is at the level of base that is 0 0.6 and average ratio is at the level of middle part that is a 0 0.8 right so please remember this 3 vq ratio in three different part of the lung apex 3.3 middle part 0 0.8 and base 0 0.6 the next line rhythmic respiration start from which part or rhythmicity of respiration is maintained by answer is basically the pacemaker neuron of respiration and the pacemaker of respiration is located at the level of pre bodzinger pre bodzinger complex yes waterfall effect is seen at the level of zone 2 of the lung okay pre bodzinger complex so please note down this important pre bodzinger very good okay so pre bodzinger is known as the pacemaker of respiration then anatomical dead space is calculated by third line anatomical dead space is calculated by okay so your answer is single breathe okay nitrogen exactly very good nitrogen wash out method single breathe nitrogen wash out method is also known as a4w le apostrophe s fowler's method right so please please remember the single breath nitrogen wash out method is also known as the fowler's method fowler's method is used for calculating the closing volume of the lung okay closing volume of the lung as well as it is also used for anatomical dead space calculation anatomical dead space calculation although you know that there is another nitrogen washout method that is known as the multiple breath nitrogen washout method multiple breath nitrogen washout method this is the modification of the fowler's method we all know that this is used for calculating the residual volume of the lung so please note down that although this is yes residual volume if you measure then you can calculate the frc also you can calculate the tlc also right so either it is residual volume or frc or tlc all these things can directly calculated by nitrogen washout method but it is a multiple breath nitrogen washout method this is a little modification of the fowler's method fowler's method was originally the single breath you will take a deep inspiration followed by a single expiration that is a single breath nitrogen washout method single breath nitrogen washout method can be used for closing volume calculation also anatomical dead space calculation also now here i will write down another thing that is a physiological dead space physiological dead space calculation you also know that there is another dead space which is known as physiological dead space is it is calculated by board's equation it is calculated by board's equation so please remember anatomical dead space is fowler's method physiological dead space is by board's 
equation. Okay? Right, very good. No, helium dilution method is the another method for measuring this residual volume. Helium dilution method or body plethysmography, they are the method for residual volume calculation. Okay, you are absolutely correct, Dr. Dibya. Okay, so we talked that this multiple breath nitrogen oxide method is used for residual volume calculation. If I ask you what is the other method, what is the other method for this residual volume calculation, your answer is helium dilution method and body plethysmography. But if the question is what is the best method for this residual volume calculation, your answer is body plethysmography, right? So, these are the things that you have to remember, okay, right. Now answer this first question. So this is the calculation I told you. INS it is very important. You have to look at the uh, small mole calculation in physiology. So at high altitude of 13,000 feet, the barometric pressure is 447 millimeter of mercury. Calculate the PiO2. So PiO2 is the partial pressure of oxygen in the inspiratory air. So this I stands for inspiratory air inspiratory air right so the formula that you have to remember for the time being what is plethysmography plethysmography we uh, it's a closed chamber where we measure the change in volume and pressure of the whole body so it's like a uh, the uh, telephone booth we used to see in the old age you know you just imagine that there is a telephone booth inside the telephone booth you are sitting and you are measuring the change in volume of your lung and pressure of your lung by some maneuver that is basically plethysmography instrument right which measure the volume change okay and pressure change so body plethysmography where the whole body volume change is measured is the best method for residual volume calculation am i clear dr mehul little bit because the whole plethysmography i cannot discuss in this session not possible so here remember that pi O2 formula is it is a PB barometric pressure minus PH2O water vapor pressure multiplied by FiO2. Okay, so I will tell you what all this thing. So PB is the barometric pressure. So the barometric pressure that has been given in this question is 447. All of you know that whenever you are ascending to the high altitude what will happen to the total barometric pressure the pb barometric pressure will be decreased and that's why it has been decreased from 760 normal that is from the 760 it has decreased to 447 sorry it has decreased to 447 millimeter of mercury now if i ascend to high altitude will there be change in water vapor pressure ph2o is not going to change it will remain constant and it has a fixed value that is 47 millimeter of mercury Please remember, water vapor pressure, why it is coming? Because whenever you take breathe in, whenever the air is entering in your respiratory system, whenever it is passing through your conducting zone, there will be addition of water vapor in the air. Or you can say, there will be moisturization of the air which is entering into your system. Now, whenever you add moisture, that is water vapor pressure you have to consider. And what is the normal water vapor pressure? 47 millimeter of mercury. And this is not going to alter with altitude. So, whenever it is total barometric pressure is decreasing to 447 millimeter of mercury, water vapor pressure will remain same, that is 47 millimeter of mercury. Right. Now, next thing is that what is this FiO2? FiO2 is the fraction of oxygen in the inspiratory air. If I ask you what is the FiO2 in sea level in our ground level that is you know 21 percentage that is a fraction percentage how much percentage of oxygen is present in the normal air that is a 21 percent if you ascend into high altitude total barometric pressure decreases but fraction of oxygen does not changes fraction of nitrogen does not changes fraction of carbon dioxide does not changes so if i o2 remain 21 percentage even in high altitude condition also now you have got all the value of this question so pb that is a barometric pressure is 447 minus 47 multiplied by 21 percentage that is 21 upon 100 so if you calculate this it will be 84 millimeter of mercury okay 160 millimeter of mercury that is the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere normal atmosphere okay 
normal atmospheric partial pressure of oxygen is 160 millimeter of mercury that is 760 multiplied by 21 if you do that is the atmospheric partial pressure of oxygen but whenever i am saying percentage okay or whenever i am saying fraction of oxygen in the inspiratory air your answer is 21 percentage got it all of you tell me whether you get this formula or not clear okay now next line that is written here at 47 degree celsius atmospheric pressure so atmospheric temperature is high all of you know that there will be sweating there will be vasodilatation and heat loss will occur from the body but the question that is asking here what is the main method for heat loss from the body okay this is clearly given in guyton radiation very very good very very good okay radiation okay so please note down this is the exact image that is given in guyton and from here the question has been asked so the environment temperature is very very high this guy is sitting on a chair and he is losing heat from his body as you can find out here the radiation is the main method obviously there will be vasodilation obviously there will be sweating but after sweating where the heat will go from your body to which place and by which method the heat is going from your body to other part that is the question they are asking here there will be sweating there will be vasodilation they are the methods of loss of heat from the body but where the heat is going from your body where it is going and by which process it is going that is the question they are asking here okay so main process is the radiation evaporation by evaporation there will be loss of 22 percent of the heat okay and by air conduction that's why we know more the air conducting surrounding your body there will be rapidly heat loss from the body that's why we switch on the fan okay and that will cool down your body uh, easily right okay and the conduction to the object on which you are sitting that is another method of heat loss from the body so these are the thing that you have to remember that the main method for losing heat from the body is radiation got it okay chalo next now one question which has been asked in uh, previous year um, aims or INI set examination this was the question that metabolic equivalent MET of 1500 ml of oxygen look at this question this was a very uh, new question okay and I have not seen this kind of question they are asking frequently but anyway this question has asked once so question was MET equivalent of 1500 ml of oxygen is how many mets okay now what is the way to calculate first you look at how to solve this i have written the whole solution here one met metabolic equivalent is defined as amount of oxygen consumed while sitting at rest so when you are in resting condition the amount of oxygen that you are consuming that is known as one met one met is equal to 3.5 ml per kg body weight per minute this is the line that you have to remember what you have to remember one mate is equal to 3.5 ml oxygen per kg body weight per minute right means in one minute one kg of body weight is consuming 3.5 ml of oxygen right so if your body weight is 70 kg if your body weight is 70 kg how much oxygen you are going to consume in one minute simple 1 kg body weight is consuming 3.5 ml of oxygen so 3.5 multiplied by 70 that is 245 ml of oxygen you are going to consume in one minute here the question has already been given that the 70 kg male person with basal oxygen consumption is 250 ml right and we have calculated here that this is 245 approximately 245 or 250 same so when a person has a body weight of 70 kg okay he is consuming 250 ml of oxygen in one minute and what the question has asked the question has asked when uh, the person is consuming 1500 ml of oxygen how many mets he is utilizing how many met met he is utilizing so simple we are going to divide this 1500 ml upon this 250 ml so 1500 upon 250 so 1500 is the total consumption and one mate for a 70 kg body weight person is 250 so 1500 upon 250 will be 6 so that's why the answer of the question was 6 
that if the oxygen consumption is 1500 ml this is equal to how many met one met for a 70 kg body weight person is 250 ml this is the question here got it okay All right very good now next again you calculate here calculate the respiratory quotient in a patient with 50 kg body weight where okay once more so one more is uh, just remember this thing just remember this line that 3.5 ml of oxygen is consumed by 1 kg body weight per minute 3.5 ml of oxygen is consumed by 1 kg body weight in 1 minute so if my body weight is 70 kg how much oxygen i am going to consume that is equal to 1 met if my body weight is 100 kg so 100 multiplied by 3.5 that is equal to 1 met for me if your body weight is 60 kg so 60 multiplied by 3.5 is equal to 1 met in your body so now if total oxygen consumption is given suppose i told that one person is consuming 3000 ml of oxygen how many met he is utilizing so just you have to divide 3000 upon your one met that is the question they are asking here okay right very good so dr prona you have given answer to this question so we all know that respiratory quotient rq is very very easy carbon dioxide exhaled by the person upon your oxygen consumption right okay so carbon dioxide upon oxygen so carbon dioxide is 200 here and oxygen is 250 here so this is 0 0.8 okay very good very good very good dr sruti dr dark knight dr pranoy all of you are giving answer okay now second question tidal volume of person is given as 500 ml so tidal volume is 500 ml okay so what is tidal volume so whenever you are taking inspiration there is certain amount of air which is entering in your lung that is 500 ml means how much is the expansion of my lung how much volume of expansion is going on in my lung that is a 500 ml so this is nothing but delta v volume change of the lung when the person is taking breath in now this volume change is occurring because of the change in intrapleural pressure we know that during inspiration intrapleural pressure become more negative we know that so intrapleural pressure is changing from this 0. Point, uh, sorry this minus 4 centimeter of water to minus 9 centimeter of water exactly right so how to calculate this delta p pressure change intrapleural pressure is going to more negative condition minus 4 to minus 9 so 4 to 9 that means it is 5 centimeter of water getting my point so delta p is 5 centimeter of water pressure here and delta v that is the volume change is nothing but tidal volume that is 500 ml here so we know that compliance is equal to delta v upon delta p so this is 500 upon 5 so this is 100 ml volume change is occurring per centimeter of water so this is the calculation of compliance just look at how much expansion of the lung is going on that is your volume change delta v and for that volume change how much intrapleural pressure or how much transpulmonary pressure change is occurring that is your delta p got it okay now coming to some of the mcq on endocrine physiology now endocrine physiology what i have seen in the last few years they are asking question mainly on receptor so just look at two tables that i will show you here just look at these two tables on receptor of difference hormone like for example igf1 act through we all know that tyrosine kinase type of receptor okay phospholipase c we all know that this is gq okay okay this g protein coupled receptor gq is connected with the phospholipase c oxytocin receptor it is a g protein coupled receptor gpcr right so this kind of single line of question they are asking from endocrinology what you have to look you have to look at this table and another table i will show you so here multiple mcqs has been asked from this same table so please note down here they have already asked that what are the hormone that act through cgmp already we have discussed one thing that is the nitric oxide okay nitric oxide 
they act through the CGMP production. Apart from that, atrial natriuretic peptide, they also work through CGMP. Okay. So, endothelium derived relaxing factor, this is EDRF, this is also similar to the nitric oxide, right? Okay. Now, receptor tyrosine kinase. Receptor tyrosine kinase can act through various small third messenger system, various small messenger system of the cell. They can be MAP kinase pathway, they can be rash, RAP and MAP kinase pathway. So, please note down, if it is MAP kinase and AKT pathway, then the hormone which is acting through it is the insulin and IGF-1. And if it is RAS, RAP and MAP kinase pathway, then the epidermal growth factor, EGF and NGF, that is a nerve growth factor, these are the two hormones, they act through RAS, RAP pathway, right? Then there are a kind of receptor which is known as a cytokine receptor which particularly act through this jack start pathway and the hormone that you have to remember here is the growth hormone and prolactin. Very, very important. I am telling you, please note down this important information. Growth hormone and prolactin, although some of the physiology books are saying they are also tyrosine kinase receptor, but here it is not exactly tyrosine kinase receptor. It is a kind of variety of tyrosine kinase receptor which is a cytokine receptor, but it act through jack start pathway. And there is another pathway which you have to remember is this MAD pathway, S-M-A-D, full form you do not have to remember. But the hormone which acts through this MAD pathway is active in transforming growth factor beta and mullerian inhibitory substances. So, please remember this important table and the other table here all the hormone which is acting through G protein couple receptor, G protein couple receptor, all the hormone which is acting through that has been given here. Already we have answered this question that oxytocin act through which kind of receptor? That is a G protein couple receptor. And they have also acted through, also ask that this phospholipase C is connected with the which kind of G protein? That is a GQ. So, we all know that adenylene cyclage AC, adenylene cyclage, they are connected with the G protein that is a GS or GI variety, S for stimulatory G protein couple okay, and I for inhibitory G protein. right? So, if it is stimulatory G protein, then it will increase the CMP and if it is inhibitory G protein, then it will decrease the CMP and different hormone has been written here. You may not remember all of this G protein couple receptor hormone, but at least you remember the previous table which is more, more important for your upcoming exam. Got it? Okay. So, you take a little time in these two tables and remember, try to remember these names. Okay. Now, quickly you answer this endocrine MCQ. Damage of pituitary stock during surgery causes increase in which of the following hormone? This was the question and I am 100 percent sure you will all answer correctly. What is the answer? Yes. So, here. prolactin. Right. Very good. Okay. I am 100 percent sure you are going to answer this. Now, next second. Hormones which is or under inhibitory control of hypothalamus. So, we again the same answer prolactin. We all know that prolactin is under the inhibitory control of dopamine. Okay. Apart from that, there is growth hormone also because somatostatin is also an inhibitor somatostatin okay so please remember if this is the question then both prolactin and growth hormone they are under inhibitory control but if the question is which hormone is only under inhibitory control then prolactin but here prolactin and growth hormone both will be the answer right and third which hormone has permissive role in puberty twice this question has been asked okay so for the onset of puberty the main hormone the main hormone or the main neuron which is required is the GnRH. Okay. This is the main. Okay. But here the question is not the main hormone. Here the question is about the permissive role. Okay. Permissive role means it is not going to cause onset of puberty, but this hormone is helpful for the other hormone which is causing onset of puberty. So, GnRH producing neuron, they are the main hormone which is responsible for onset of puberty. Now, this GnRH hormone is stimulated by one peptide KISS, KISS peptide. Okay. So, this neuron is known as a KISS neuron, KISS, KISS neuron, right? And this yes, and this KISS neuron is again stimulated by leptin. Okay. So, that is why 
the leptin is the hormone which has permissive role for onset of puberty so please please remember kiss peptin yes okay so this kiss peptin name is very important so kiss peptin is a stimulus for gnrh gnrh is the main neuron which is responsible for onset of puberty pulsatile secretion of gnrh will be there and this gnrh is helped by kiss peptide producing neuron and kiss peptin producing neuron is again helped by leptin so leptin is basically helping the onset of puberty but it is not absolutely for onset of puberty there are other things there are other um, uh, this uh, permissive role are other also there like for example um, you know that neuropeptide y they also has some um, role like leptin okay and there are others also like for example you know ki neuropeptide y serotonin they are also uh, has role for onset of puberty but for the timing you just remember leptin okay now next neurotransmitter released by inner hair cell during depolarization so single single line single single answer your answer will be glue ta met okay so all of you know that whenever the hair cell is moving there will be depolarization of the hair cell and the hair cell is going to produce neurotransmitter that will cause a stimulation of the auditory nerve which neurotransmitter glutamate second thing that they asked that this inner hair cell depolarization depolarization is done by entry of which ion your answer will be potassium greater than calcium i hope all of you know the reason that inner hair cell they are present in the organ of corti and organ of corti is dipped inside the scala media and the scala media is very rich in potassium so whenever the hair cell is bending okay potassium will enter into the cell that will causes depolarization this depolarization will causes release of neurotransmitter and that is glutamate that's all now endocochlear potential you know that endocochlear potential means scala media contain a fluid which is very rich in potassium because of which it contain positive charge in comparison to the surrounding fluid and the answer is plus 80 to plus 85 millivolt this is the normal endocochlear potential right minus 15 to minus 40 that is the rmp of the rods and cones of the retina right not here so endocochlear potential it is a positive voltage which is present in the scala media fluid due to huge amount of potassium inside it due to huge amount of calcium inside it and the voltage is plus 80 to plus 85 millivolt right okay most sensitive area of the brain to hypoxia so whenever there is hypoxia this area of the brain is going to be damaged first your answer will be bolo your answer will be hippocampus your answer will be hippocampus which area of the hippocampus ca1 region of the hippocampus ca1 region is also known as s o m m e r apostrophe s summers area right if this hippocampus is not given in the choices then cerebellum cerebellum the purkinje cell of cerebellum the purkinje cell of cerebellum and even if it is that not given in the choices then it is the basal ganglia the striatum neuron of basal ganglia is important right summer area smme apostrophe right very good so these are the area which are most sensitive to hypoxia okay next sensation detected by passinian corpuscles so the question that has been asked in ini set the answer was pressure okay so we all know that passinian corpuscle they are the receptor for touch and pressure but if the question is the best sensation detected by passinian corpuscle your answer will be vibration very good very good so vibration is a kind of pressure only okay but the question that has been asked already their vibration option was not there but if vibration option is there then that is the best answer to choose okay if vibration is not there obviously it's a general touch and pressure receptor you can also detect the touch and pressure right but which kind of touch and pressure most important vibration right discriminatory touch second line bolo what is the answer so discriminatory touch means the question is basically asking you that the two point discrimination i told you earlier also two point discrimination is not by meissner's it is by markels it is by markels because markels is a receptor where the receptor
reactive field is the smallest and that's why it is the best receptor for point discrimination two point discrimination this is also the receptor which is responsible for reading braille okay so this two point discrimination braille reading all of the answer is nothing but your Merkel's 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 okay don't confuse don't make confusion now believe me okay a vanilloid receptor see there is a receptor which is known as TRP V V stands for vanilloid so each of V then this stands for vanilloid okay and this TRP stands for transient receptor potential channel transient receptor potential channel so these are the channels which are activated by capsaicin and it produces pain so the vanilloid receptor are activated by capsaicin or this is nothing but your nociception so vanilloid receptor they are basically your nociceptor it is activated by certain chemicals like capsaicin it can also be activated by h plus ion right so these are the thing that you have to remember vanilloid receptor are activated by pain okay what uh, yeah, if the pain is not given in the choices suppose which substances can activate it your answer is capsaicin or h plus ion got it okay now next question papage circuit involve which thalamic nucleus so the answer is given here this is the whole papage circuit see yes mirchi mirchi ka <coughs> ingredient is the capsaicin very good so whole papage circuit is given here exactly so please remember hippocampus mammillary body anterior nucleus of hypothalamus so please remember anterior nucleus of hypothalamus is part of the pape circuit followed by cingulate gyrus parahippocampus and enterohinals so here i will say one thing you remember that this hippocampus all of you know that this is the brain area which is responsible for conversion of the short term to long term memory right short term to long term memory this mammillary body and anterior hypothalamic nucleus they are responsible for recent memory formation they are the area recent memory and this enterohinal cortex and parahippocampal gyrus they are responsible for spatial memory memory of three dimensional space right and this singular gyrus it is responsible for controlling your blood pressure controlling your heart rate controlling your emotion right obviously the other area are also there for emotion amygdala here see i have not put amygdala in this part okay there is a distant relationship but this is the main circuit which i have collected from different books so this is the main circuit which is known as a pape circuit obviously that is connected with the amygdala but it is not a direct part of pape circuit okay now next is uh, here i have uh, put some of the thalamic nucleus apart from so here they are asking that which thalamic nucleus is the part of the pape circuit we have already discussed that is the anterior thalamic nucleus so sometimes they may ask you other nucleus of thalamus what are they like vpl and vpm ventro postro lateral and ventro postro medial all of you know that these two nucleus of the thalamus are very very important because all the ascending tract sensory tracts they pass through this two nucleus so here it is written it is a part of the somatosensory system important <coughs> then lateral and medial geniculate nucleus of thalamus all of you know that lateral geniculate body is a part of the okay visual pathway and medial geniculate body they are the part of the hearing okay or the auditory pathway so lateral and medial geniculate nucleus they are vision and hearing respectively then this two is important ventro lateral nucleus of thalamus and ventro anterior nucleus of thalamus ventro lateral nucleus of thalamus they are mainly connected with the cerebellum and ventro anterior nucleus they are mainly connected with the basal ganglia just remember this one one word suppose one question is asking that one scientist is trying to modulate one thalamic nucleus for the treatment of parkinsonism disease which thalamic nucleus you try to concentrate or which thalamic nucleus we will try to destroy or activate whatever right so obviously this ventro anterior nucleus this is connected with the basal ganglia so this is the best nucleus i have to choose for the treatment of thalamic i mean treatment of parkinson and disease patient getting my point so this way you have to remember that va for basal ganglia vl for cerebellum although vl is also connected with the basal ganglia but it is the va which is main and dorsomedial nucleus okay so please remember dorsomedial nucleus i have written two things one is the control of the eye movement and second is the olfactory pathway so we all know that olfactory pathway jo hota hai na okay it is the pathway it is the only sensory pathway which reaches to your cortex 
bypassing the thalamus okay first the pathway of olfaction will not go to the thalamus first it will go to cortex okay but after reaching the cortex some fiber of the olfactory pathway will also go to the different thalamic nucleus and they are asking that which thalamic nucleus is involved in the olfactory pathway this is known as the newer pathway of olfaction new pathway of olfaction so if the question is new pathway of olfaction goes through which nucleus of the thalamus your answer will be dorsal medial nucleus of thalamus got it so this way you remember this important thalamic nucleus i believe that this is important one now next one without external cues duration of the sleep wake cycle it has been asked in one ems question few years ago so this sleep wake cycle we all know that this is a kind of circadian rhythm and the circadian rhythm is maintained by biological clock that is a suprachiasmatic nucleus and suprachiasmatic nucleus got various input external cues and this external cues are known as z giver okay external cues are known as a z giver so suprachiasmatic nucleus is modulated by various external cues and suprachiasmatic nucleus is the biological clock which is maintaining the circadian rhythm one of the important circadian rhythm is sleep wake cycle okay if you destroy this suprachiasmatic nucleus or you remove the external cues your sleep wake cycle duration will not be 24 hour it will be more than 24 hours so please remember the sleep wake cycle in human will be greater than 24 hour this was given in the choices exactly if you ask me how much greater than means there may be any value but this is 24.15 hour as given by additions so whenever you remove the external cues or you destroy the suprachiasmatic nucleus of uh, hypothalamus what will happen to your sleep wake cycle duration it will be greater than 24 hour 24.15 hour exactly right the next question the processing of short term memory to the long term just now we have discussed it is a hippocampus it is a hippocampus right okay okay cell bodies of the orexonergic neuron so this orexin producing neuron orexin is also known as the hypocretin you know that orexinergic neuron if it is destroyed then there will be narcolepsy you must have heard in uh, psychiatric um, subject okay so this destruction of the orexinergic neuron they are one of the cause of the narcolepsy disorder so this orexinergic neuron they are located in which part of the hypothalamus lateral hypothalamus very good no it is not posterior it's the lateral hypothalamic nucleus okay lateral hypothalamic nucleus is the location of orexinergic neuron so orexinergic neuron obviously they are responsible for sleep wake cycle okay when the orexinergic neuron is activated you will remain awake okay so this orexinergic neuron are very very important for switching between wakefulness and directly into REM sleep wakefulness and REM sleep this switching over is done by modulation of this orexinergic neuron apart from that orexinergic neuron is also responsible for food intake control and also responsible for pain modulation at least you remember these three actions so sleep wake cycle modulation by orexinergic neuron food intake and third is the pain modulation okay this much is at least for this exam at least remember this now uh, next a monkey is having increased sexual activity okay increase appetite anger no fear yeah so this is typical of the kluver bussy syndrome okay kluver bussy syndrome and all of you know that the kluver bussy syndrome is destruction of the medial temporal lobe okay medial temporal lobe including amygdala medial temporal lobe including amygdala so this is the answer that you have to remember so kluver bussy syndrome we all know that hyper orality hyper sexuality okay visual agnosia and placidity these are the features of the syndrome okay now next during muscle contraction detachment of the myosin head attachment of the myosin head with actin will be done in presence of calcium 
but detachment of the myosin head will done by presence of adenosine triphosphate that's why you know that whenever there is death of the cell cell death there will be rigor mortis so rigor mortis all of you know that if the atp is deficient from the cell attachment will be there contraction will be there but the muscle will not be able to the myosin will not be able to detach from actin and that's why there will be a sustained persistent contraction after death and that is nothing but your rigor mortis so this atp is very very crucial very very important for the detachment of the myosin head from actin right next physiological mechanism behind transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation so not only this tense you have to remember this transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation you know there will be two electrical pad on your skin surface and the low electrical current will flow through your skin this transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation as well as your acupuncture acupuncture as well as your massaging okay all of them activate the gate control theory of pain gate control theory is operated at the level of dorsal root region of the spinal cord right okay very good now duration of the short term memory on an average remember 30 second or lesser exactly it is 18 second but the question that was given in aims it was 30 second will be your answer 30 second or less very good 20 to 30 second so duration is 30 second but exactly it is 18 second so please remember this that working memory okay this is the question that working memory is 18 to 20 second right and short term memory it is also second in and around 30 second right so in and around 30 second so basically this working memory and short term memory both of them are similar working memory there will be manipulation of the information right okay and short term memory there is no manipulation of the information like for example if i give uh, one number and i ask you to remember that number you will try to recall that number and i will try to find out that this number is close to my date of birth okay so what you are doing you are manipulating the information we use some mnemonics for remembering some information so whenever you are manipulating the information okay that is your working memory and no manipulation means that is purely short term memory okay so working memory the prefrontal cortex is mainly involved short term memory the hippocampus is mainly involved and long term memory we all know that it is stored at the level of neocortex just remember this crucial information got it okay now next golgi tendon organ senses which of the following we all know that golgi tendon organ senses the increase in tension at the level of muscle tendon obviously if there is chronic hypoxia there will be impairment of the memory right okay and if the question is muscle spindle muscle spindle then we have to remember that it can be activated by increased length of the muscle as well as increase in velocity of the muscle so muscle spindle can detect both length and velocity of the muscle muscle tendon uh, sorry golgi tendon organ it detect tension the next is the motor unit motor unit is single motor neuron just remember single motor neuron and the muscles fiber and the muscles fibers supplied by it supplied by it this is the thing that you have to remember muscle spindle and single neuron motor neuron and how many muscle fiber it is supplying that is the definition of motor unit right okay now next is in skeletal muscle dhpr and ryr are coupled by remember in skeletal muscle the coupling is electro mechanical coupling yes if the electrode is also not there now then your answer will be mechanical coupling and in cardiac muscle and in cardiac muscle if the question is then your answer is electrochemical coupling very good electrochemical coupling okay so these two things you remember for skeletal muscle electromechanical coupling so mechanical is the main thing and in cardiac muscle electrochemical chemical is the main thing right which group of fiber is least susceptible to local anesthesia so you have to remember the anesthesia a gamma is the most susceptible fiber followed by a delta followed by a alpha and a beta 
greater than B greater than C. So, the least susceptible fiber to local anesthesia is C fiber. Okay. Do not follow Genong here. Least susceptible fiber is C fiber. Just remember this. Maximum susceptible or most susceptible fiber to local anesthesia is A gamma. So, what is the sequence I have written here? Try to remember. Okay. Now, next is Renser cell inhibition is which type of inhibition? Renser cell inhibition, you know that it occurs at the level of spinal cord, at the level of motor neuron. It is a kind of feedback inhibition, feed back inhibition or recurrent inhibition. This just remember these two words feedback inhibition or recurrent and glycine is the neurotransmitter for this neuron. Synaptic potential can be recorded by micro electrode. Okay. Why they are known as micro electrode? Because the diameter of the tip of this electrode is less than 0 0.5 micrometer. That is why they are known as the micro electrode. Now, calculate the fre following frequency of the skeletal muscle. No, no, no. Calculate the tetanizing frequency. So, this question has been asked multiple times. Calculate the tetanizing frequency of the skeletal muscle from the given option. So, this question has been asked three times in M's. So, tetanizing frequency of skeletal muscle is calculated 1 upon contraction period duration, 1 upon CP. So, what is 1? 1 means 1 second, 1 second means 1000 millisecond upon your contraction period, contraction period duration is given here is 40 millisecond. So, 1000 upon 40, so this is 25 hertz. Please note down. This is very, very important for M sin I said question. Okay. Next. Next is highest frequency of BER. You know that for G GIT, if you have to read only one thing, then it is your BER, basal electrical rhythm or basic electrical rhythm. So, this basal electrical rhythm or basic electrical rhythm is also known as the slow wave of GIT. And slow wave of GIT is generated by interstitial cells of casals right and the highest frequency is seen in at the level of duodenum very good but not only duodenum you have to remember the rate of every part for the BER so please remember that BER has a highest frequency at the level of duodenum right followed by jejunum followed by distal ileum and minimum frequency see here it is a cecum where the minimum frequency. But if the cecum is not given in the option, sigmoid colon or stomach can also be answered. So, these are the rate. That is why, yes, lowest is the cecum, but sometimes cecum is not given in the choices. That is why you also have to remember stomach is 4 and your sigmoid colon is 6 per minute. Okay? Now, migratory motor complex reappear at an interval of 90 minutes. So, all of us know that migratory motor complex is a kind of fasting motility. Fasting motility. So, whenever you are fasting for at least 90 minutes, then the migratory motor complex will start and second migratory motor complex will start at an interval of 90. So, both the time if the question is how much fasting is required for starting of the migratory motor complex, again your answer is 90 minute fasting at least required for MMC to start and after starting of one MMC, second MMC will start again after an interval of 90 minutes. Highest concentration of potassium is seen in obviously easier, but option was there the which GI secretion. Basically, the question is highest concentration of potassium in which GI secretion. Your answer is colon rectum. Okay. Here the question is concentration, but if the question is highest amount of potassium is secreted in which fluid then salivary. Just remember this important thing. If the amount of total amount of potassium secreted in one day maximum from which gland salivary secretion. But if the concentration if the question is concentration of potassium in uh, which secretion is maximum then answer is colorectal fluid right. Okay. So, this is done. Next is uh, the last one that is a general physiology in negative feedback feedback gain is infinity in. So, we all know that gain is equal to correction upon your error. Okay. So, in this thing, if the error is 0, suppose correction is something, but error is 0, then this ratio will be infinity. 
and this is typically seen in case of kidney when the kidney is regulating your blood volume okay or the kidney is regulating your blood pressure in these two condition the error is absolutely zero means kidney can correct your blood volume your blood pressure absolutely to normal level without any residual error that is the meaning of infinity gain right and in the second question they are asking you to calculate the gain so simple so here the systolic blood pressure is reduced by 10 and then it is regained to 8 millimeter mercury so there is fall of 10 followed by there is increase of 8 10 fall followed by increase in 8 so there is still some error that is remaining that is 10 minus 8 that is 2 millimeter of mercury and how much okay how much um, correction is done correction is done is equal to 8 millimeter of mercury all of you got it so if you calculate this gain correction upon error so obviously it will be gain is equal to correction upon error that is 4 and this is minus 4 because the correction is occurring in the opposite direction so the fall is going in the downward direction and correction is in the opposite direction so it is minus 4 actually okay now next gibbs donan equilibrium is mainly by so please note down this question has been asked in i and i said this is due to large impermeable ion large impermeable ion and protein is the most common answer here protein was the answer of the question exactly very good now potential develop second second major potential develop due to free movement of diffusible ion the answer is Nernst equation so please note down one thing if the question is same potential developed due to free movement of multiple diffusible ion multiple diffusible ions through cell membrane then your answer will be goldman hodgkin cas equation goldman hodgkin cas equation yes ghk equation goldman hodgkin cas equation this is the equation which is also used for calculation of the resting membrane potential of cell membrane okay because rmp is generated by multiple ions potassium is the main followed by chloride followed by sodium so whenever multiple ions are moving through the cell membrane then the potential can be calculated by goldman hodgkin cas equation but when a single ion is passing through the cell membrane nernst equation is the best okay next now this question is based on the nernst equation and an ion is having the following concentration so the ecf concentration ecf concentration is 10 milliequivalent per liter icf concentration is 10 milliequivalent per liter equilibrium potential so all of us know that equilibrium potential this is nothing but nernst equation nernst equation is saying equilibrium potential is equal to rt by zf upon log base 10 okay log base 10 concentration of the ion outside the cell concentration of the ion inside the cell okay then we all know that if you simplify this this r t and f so this r t and f they are the basically constant it will be plus 61 upon z log base 10 concentration of the ion outside upon inside now in this question this is an anion so z will be negative minus 1 so if i calculate here equilibrium potential will be plus 61 upon minus 1 assuming that the uh, valency of the ion is minus 1 okay outside concentration is 100 inside concentration is 10 so log 10 base 10 it will be 1 right? so log 10 it will be 100 upon 10 is equal to 10 so log 10 with base 10 is equal to 1 so this whole fraction will be minus 61 millivolt right so this we have to calculate please please remember this equation is one of the important equation they are asking frequently in ini set examination okay now last few lines iodine 125 labeled albumin is used for measurement of which fluid compartment that is the actual thing which fluid compartment we know that whenever it is albumin we use to calculate the plasma volume so look at this table this is important one of the important table so plasma volume is calculated either by evans blue or by iodine tagged with albumin 
So, this is the different substances which is used for calculating different body water. Okay. Plasma is calculated by Evans blue or iodine tagged with albumin, iodine tagged albumin. Now, second interstitial fluid volume can be calculated by, it cannot be calculated directly. You have to calculate the extracellular fluid minus plasma. So, you have to calculate the extracellular fluid also and plasma volume also. So, if you look at extracellular fluid volume can be calculated by inulin, sucrose, sodium isotope, okay, 125, iodine 125, iothalamate as well as manitol. Please note down these are the very, very important. And then how this ICF can be measured, total body water you measure, from that you measure the ECF, you can get the ICF and interstitial fluid volume, ECF you measure minus U plasma, okay. So, this is the way by which we measure the different volume, right, very good, okay. So, ECF minus plasma. Now, feed forward control system. So, please note down the examples of feed forward control system. We all know that feed forward control system means anticipatory system. The question that has been asked in AIMS, what are the options? Options was this, thermo regulation, very good. Okay, so you are doing the PQ, okay, PYQ. So that's why you know the thermoregulation. Thermoregulation has both feedback control also, feed forward control also, but main is the feed forward. Apart from that, what are the other examples of feed forward control? Okay, cephalic phase of gastric secretion, cephalic phase of gastric secretion. So when you are looking at the food, the stomach is secreting acid in anticipation that the food will reach in the stomach that is one anticipation. Then increase in heart rate, increase in respiratory rate even before, even before start of exercise. So, you are just thinking that you have to start the exercise and your heart rate will start increasing. So, that is also an example of feed forward control system, right? So, please, please, yes. So, this is known as a psychic stimulation. You are thinking and your heart rate is increasing, okay? So, these are the things which are known as the feed forward control system. Feed forward control system is also there at the level of cerebellum, cerebellum, right? Inhibition of the Purkinje cell, exactly. Inhibition of the Purkinje cell by stellate or basket cell. They are also the examples of feed forward control system. So, these are the thing exactly anxiety before exam that is rising or heart rate that is rising or respiratory rate that is also feed forward control system same like that of the exercise okay so with this we are ending this session okay i hope this will be beneficial for you so it's a quick revision of most of the important thing and i told you that there is one uh, image based question session also okay please uh, look at the images, the important images that I have discussed. If you do not get the link, please contact me, I will give you the link. So, thank you so much and best of luck for your exam. Tata, bye bye, take care.